All right. Well, hello, everyone. Let's uh, go ahead and get started with our, our webinar here. Hopefully everyone can see the, the slides here. So on behalf of ARMA and the uh, Technical Committee on Induced Seismicity, uh, myself, Sean Maxwell, Ahmad Ghassami, the chairs, as well as Jens Lansni and Mahdi Haddad, we, we welcome you to our, our webinar series. So, so today we're very excited to have Jean-Philippe Avouac. I apologize for the pronunciation, <laughs> Jean-Philippe, <laughs> who's going to give a very interesting presentation, I'm sure, on earthquake probability and uh, what we can do to control it. So just before we uh, pass it over to Jean-Philippe, just uh, a few introductory remarks, and then, uh, then we'll listen to Jean-Philippe's presentation. So I'm going to pass it over to Jens. Okay, yeah, thank you, Sean. And I'll just announce two speakers coming up and we're talking to a few more um, for upcoming uh, monthly webinar presentations. Next month, January, Denise Templeton from Lawrence Livermore will be speaking. Note the date uh, is not the first February, uh, the first Friday of the month as it normally is uh, because of the New, the New Year's holiday. It'll be the 13th of January, same time. He's talking, to, uh, talking about a project lifetime approach to the management of induced seismicity risk at carbon capture storage sites. And then the following month, again on the first Friday of that month, Lei Jin and Bill Curry from ExxonMobil will be talking about GIST. I hope I'm pronouncing that the way you all are pronouncing it, or GIST, a geomechanical injection scenario toolkit for rapid analysis of injection related earthquakes. Um, and stay tuned for additional ones. Uh, we'll be sending out announcements. And um, please uh, let us know if you'd like to be added or have anyone added to the email distribution list. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Mahdi Haddad from the Bureau of Economic Geology. I welcome everyone for joining us uh, for another great webinar by Dr. J.P. Avwak uh, from Caltech. Uh, first of all, uh, please feel free to share the webinar invite. Anyone interested in being added to the distribution list for uh, upcoming webinars should contact the committee uh, to receive the uh, invitation email. We have 268 people from the industry to 27 people from the academia and 22 people from the regulatory agency in the distribution list. Uh, we would like to extend that to more interested people to this webinar series. <clears throat> uh, for better uh, uh, flow of this webinar, we ask everyone to be muted during the talk. And then after uh, uh, that, we can go to a question and answer session uh, uh, with the questions that are submitted in the chat function of the Zoom meeting. Uh, we would like to summarize those questions to use the time more efficiently, but after the formal part of the meeting, uh, you can be unmuted to ask your verbal questions. And this meeting is specifically recorded uh, and uh, this recording will be available in our uh, YouTube channel. Please refer to the invitation email for the link to this YouTube channel and uh, also subscribe to this channel for future notifications. Without further delay, uh, let's invite Dr. Avwak to take over the stage. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to give, give this talk. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased to, to reach out to a different community than the community I'm joined talking to. It's, it's really my pleasure. Um, I'm going to give you a tour of the research we've been doing in my group over the last few years on our earthquake forecasting. And I'll be using work that, were, that was done by a number of postdoc and students who've been uh, working in my group. And you will see their names appearing on the slides that I will be showing later on. So, uh, the, the, the roadmap for the talk today. I start with some basic notion of earthquake phenology uh, on fault mechanics. I, I guess that you are already well familiar with those notions, but uh, I think it's because they're important for the talk. Uh, I thought I would, I would uh, provide a refresh to get started. Then I will move to uh, discussing time independent forecasting of natural seismicity. And then I will move more to induce seismicity and, and show how modeling can be used actually for control and optimization uh, of induced seismicity, might be used for control and optimization 
of induced seismicity. So earthquake phenomenology, let's start with an example. So we're looking here at the, the front of the Himalaya. And uh, what you see here uh, are the black dots. These are the earthquakes that were recorded over uh, a certain number of, of, uh, of years, I think 20 years, uh, using a local uh, network. And uh, you see them also on this slide, maybe a little bigger. They follow the front of the high range. And what you have in red is front of the Himalaya that uh, is locked uh, in the interseismic period. So we know from geodesy and ge ge geology that this fault is there, but it's not moving from the surface uh, to a depth of about 15 kilometers. It's basically locked. And so what we see is that most of the earthquake occur actually near the transition from the locked zone to the creeping zone. Here, the fault is creeping at about two centimeters per year uh, below the high Himalaya and southern Tibet. So there is stress building up along that edge. And this is triggering uh, seismicity all the time. Every day or so, uh, you, you have a magnitude three or something like that. So most of these earthquakes stay small, but once in a while, they grow bigger, as happened during the 2015 Gorka earthquake. And here, I'm showing this example because uh, this earthquake is relatively well constrained because it, it occurred right below an array of, of uh, high rate GPS station. And uh, we were able to, to, to derive a kinematic model of the source. So the earthquake started here uh, at the uh, east, east western end of the rupture area, and it propagated southward. It lasted uh, for uh, about a minute, less than a minute. And, um, and it ripped a, a, a distance over 150 kilometers. So you have earthquakes being triggered in this zone of stress buildup all the time. And once in a while, uh, they, 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 they grow bigger. So when you look now at uh, the, the structure of a seismicity catalog uh, in terms of the distance in time and in space between events, what you generally find is that you have a bimodal distribution. So here, this plot is made using the, the technique that was introduced by uh, Zaliapin and Ben Zion. So here you have the time between two successive events rescaled. And here, this is the distance also rescaled. And you see two modes here. So this mode, which are the events that are closer in time and space, correspond to mostly the aftershocks. You might have also uh, four shocks in that mode. This one, which is more elongated along the diagonal of the plot, represents actually the background seismicity. So it would be most of these black dots I was showing in the previous slides. And when you look at the inter-event distribution of those uh, events here, what you find is that they follow an exponential distribution, which is an indication that they are, they are Poisson process. So it's a memoryless uh, process. By contrast, when you look at the events in that mode here, you see that they are strongly clustered and they follow typically the Omori law, meaning that uh, you have a large event. So then following that uh, uh, event, you have a sequence of aftershocks with the number of earthquakes in increasing as a function of time uh, according to a, a logarithmic function. So which is equivalent to say that the seismicity rate during the aftershocks is decaying as one over T. The, the p-value is typically of the order of unity. Okay, so Another important phenomenological law is that uh, if you look at the magnitude frequency distribution of earthquake, according to this kind of standard plot, where you have here the log of the number of earthquakes with magnitude uh, larger than the abscissa value, uh, you generally observe, um, a, a, you get a straight line, a linear relationship. The slope of that, of that uh, linear relationship is the B, the B, B value minus the slope. And so typically the, the B value is the, of the order of unity, meaning that, for example, you have 10 times less magnitude seven on larger than you have magnitude six on larger. The intercepts, so the, the number of earthquake with magnitude larger than zero, when you actually interpolate, uh, extrapolate this curve to a, a value uh, of magnitude zero is the A value. And on the A characterize the, 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 the the, uh, the, the productivity of earthquakes. 
when you want to do seismic hazard, you need to estimate A, you need to estimate B, and you, there's another quantity, uh, which is actually where to end that distribution, M max. I won't talk too much about that, but one way just to introduce the principle, one way to concern the max is to impose a balance of strain. Is, so the, the idea that the earthquake uh, cannot release more strain than the deficit of strain that is accumulating in the interseismic period due to fault being locked. Okay. So, uh, so that's a way to place a, a limit on, on M max in a, a active tectonic context like the Himalayan, for example. Okay, so now, uh, if you want to forecast earthquakes, uh, what you um, what uh, you need is an ID of um, the distribution uh, in time and space of the of 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 the of the earthquakes. Typically, you're going to assume a magnitude frequency distribution which follow the Gutenberg Richter law, and um, so you need to estimate uh, in that case uh, a b. M max and how these quantities vary in time and in space. So let's not talk about how we might do that based on, on basic notions of fault mechanics. So I guess you are all familiar with this kind of plot. Here you have the effective normal stress, the normal stress minus the pore pressure. Here you have the shear stress. And as you know, if you take a, a facet with any orientation in space, the state of stress on that facet will plot uh, within that yellow area that is separating, that is limited by three more circles, uh, which are intersecting the, 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 the effective normal stress at the principal value, sigma one minus p, sigma two, sigma two minus p, and sigma three minus p. So, if you take, for example, uh, uh, a family of facets uh, with low cohesion, uh, low cohesion um, pre existing faults represented by the black dots here on, on that diagram, and, um, and, um, and you assume that the, the medium itself has a com some cohesion, you would have two failure envelope. So one would be the dashed line, this would be the failure envelope for the medium. Uh, consider intact, and uh, this one would represent the, the, the failure condition for those pre-existing faults. So uh, as uh, stress is changing due to tectonic loading or to uh, whatever perturbation we may introduce with um, uh, reservoir operation, injection of fluids or whatever, uh, you might actually bring the state of stress closer to failure, and you might risk a condition where those pre-existing faults might be reactivated, or eventually you might create new factors uh, in the intact medium. So it is based on this reasoning. We know that for, for rocks, this straight line representing the failure function works relatively well. And so all you need to know to, to, to quantify the, the probability of failure is how much closer the state of stress on a particular facet is getting to the failure envelope. So you, if you go from this state of stress to this one, uh, what really quantify how, how much closer to failure you, you've gone would be uh, this uh, red, um, red arrow. So it is conventional to quantify uh, the, how, how much closer you get for, uh, from failure due to a stress change with this quantity delta CFF, uh, the, the, the Coulomb stress change, which is the change in shear stress minus the friction, uh, uh, the friction, the coefficient of the friction, the slope of that line, multiplied by the change in effective normal stress. Okay, we know that this criterion works uh, very well to explain after the distribution of aftershocks following large earthquakes. This was established a long time ago with, by people like Jeff King, Ross Stein, and others. And um, so let's now discuss how we can move from uh, the notion that Coulomb stress changes can be used to determine how much closer you get to failure to actually predict the seismicity rate change. So let's take a very simple uh, analog model where you have a slider pulled by a spring. So, technodic loading is equivalent to actually pulling on the spring. Uh, 
uh, the shear stress will increase. And if, if you have a very simple system where the friction drops from uh, static to dynamic uh, during sliding, you will have a periodic uh, system here with uh, the number of earthquakes being proportional to uh, the, the distance uh, of, of um, with, with, with the, the stress uh, change in that case. So which is equivalent to how much you know, uh, pull you've, uh, you apply to that, to that spring. So in, in, a, in a system where earthquakes are assumed instantaneous and the, the loading is monot monotonous, the seismicity rate uh, is proportional to the stressing rate. Uh, and this can be extended to, uh, to, uh, to th the 3D medium. And here, you just need to, re to replace the, the, the shear stress by the Coulomb stress rate. OK, so um, this is neglecting one important uh, thing, is that we know that earthquakes are not instantaneous uh, from lab experiments and from the observation that earthquakes are not very sensitive to to solid earth tides, we know that uh, earthquakes take a certain time to nucleate. From laboratory law, um, we know that uh, the transition from static to dynamic friction is not instantaneous, and actually that the friction depends uh, not only uh, depend on, on, on two variables, one being the slip rate, and the other being a state variable uh, that's going to, uh, to help uh, allow for healing between slip events. And so uh, there are different uh, flavor of, of um, the way to describe a uh, laboratory experiment with this kind of formalism. This is called right on state friction. So here I'm, I'm using the, the, the aging law that was introduced by, by, by Dietrich. And um, if you look at uh, the take, the form it takes at steady state when the state the variable is not evolving anymore, uh, you can uh, establish the condition to get uh, a stick slip behavior. And uh, when you do that, you find that the fault needs to have a critical size uh, that needs to be larger than a certain value that is given by this equation. So I'm not going to derive it. It's, it's well established, but I, I point only to one key element of that, of that, um, of that equation that I uh, will come back to later on, is that it scales as one over the effective normal stress, meaning that when the effective normal stress go to zero, either because the pre pressure, the pore pressure gets high or the normal stress gets low, uh, this quantity uh, can get to infinity and all you can get is creep. You should not get stick slip event anymore. So to, to get stick slip event, you need this quantity to be negative. It might just be negative. And you need the fault to have a critical size larger than uh, this, this value. So based on this formal, formalism, you can uh, calculate the uh, evolution of slip on a fault as a function of time. And so if you, if you take a circular crack uh, loaded at a constant rate, what you find is that uh, slip, uh, it slips all the time, uh, very uh, slowly initially, and then you have uh, a typical exponential uh, acceleration uh, and, uh, until you get the slip event. And so uh, you, you can actually, from the equation, derive an analytical expression that's going to describe how, uh, how, uh, how this, the slip is evolving uh, during the interseismic period. So it looks like it's nearly locked for a long period of time, and then it accelerates uh, before rupture happens. But actually, in reality, it trips all the time. So with this formalism, you start to see uh, what happens. You, you can actually uh, understand what happens when you have uh, a sudden stress change. So uh, here, you, you have uh, an example of a fault, which is initially sliding at a certain velocity, and uh, which would have rupture at this point uh, in time. Let's assume that you apply suddenly uh, a stress change at, at, a, uh, at a certain time. Uh, you suddenly accelerate slip on the fall to that point. And then you can show from the equation that the rupture uh, the, 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 will happen at a time that is advanced uh, 
and the, that that you can calculate analytically. The, that curve here is just the equivalent of that curve that has been shifted here. So an increase of coolant stress results in, in, in a time advance. And because of the shape of, of that curve, uh, Dietrich has shown, has shown that if you take a population of earthquakes that uh, of fault that would have resulted in a constant rate of seismicity, which is shown here, you see that the spacing between all those curve uh, is constant. And now you apply uh, a sudden uh, stress increase at, 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 at a certain time. Uh, you are going to transform that population of event that would have been uniform in time to a cluster. Uh, you have an acceleration of the seismicity right after the application of the stress. Now, this is a very elegant way to explain uh, the, the Omorillo, because prediction from that uh, formalism is that then you, you, you get a 1 over t decay of the seismicity rate. So... Uh, KJ Im has, has been uh, developing a, a model of discrete uh, fault um, to actually re replicate this, this behavior. And this is just a simulation show, showing the coolant stress changes calculated from the model. Uh, you have the time evolution of slip on the fault. And what is interesting is that uh, from this uh, model, you can produce very, very realistic uh, size-PC catalog. Uh, you get the Gutenberg distribution shown here, and you get uh, the Omorillo as, uh, as was proposed by, um, by, uh, by Dietrich uh, 94. Uh, what is interesting, in fact, is that even if you take for a random initial uh, distribution of, of velocity, you you still get the the, the Omorillo. Uh, so it's it's in fact independent from the uh, from the uh, assumption on the initial distribution uh, of of, of uh, velocity on the fault. Anyway, so now um, you can use that formalism to derive an equation that will uh, give you the evolution of the seismicity rate R. Uh, as a function of the change of the Coulomb stress. Um, so this is uh, an extension of the equation that was introduced initially by, by, by Dietrich, uh, 94. Uh, the main difference here is that um, we don't consider that the population is initially um, in, in um, over steady state. We don't assume that you have a population that is uh, toward acceleration, which was one uh, uh, one assumption that Dietrich was, was, was doing. In that case, uh, if you take into account that the population might be initially in a relaxed state, if it's a quiet tectonic environment, it introduces a, a threshold here. So in this formalism, you have basically um, uh, three parameters, the stress threshold, A sigma, and the quantity uh, TA. Uh, a sigma and TR, two, two parameters that were already in the Twitch model. The, 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 the addition is this uh, threshold. So um, let's see now how we can make use of these notions to make a, a forecast. And let's start with the example of uh, natural seismicity in the Himalaya, uh, in the India Asia collision uh, zone context. So this is going to be time independent. The reason is that we are looking at the response of the size species to, uh, to uh, loading due to, to, the, to the motion to the, of India into Eurasia at a constant rate. So there is no variation in the loading rate in that system, or we assume that there is none. So here is the, the size specificity uh, observed over um, a few decades. Here is the geodetic strain measured from, uh, um, from GPS uh, stations. So from geodesy, you can calculate um, uh, the, 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 from the displacement field, you can calculate actually uh, the, the strain tensor. You can calculate the principal uh, strain direction, uh, horizontal strain direction, which is shown here. In, in, uh, in, red, in red, it is compression. In blue, it is extension. And uh, from the earthquake focal mechanism, this time you can also invert the focal mechanisms for the, for, uh, the stress distribution. So assuming that slip is parallel to, to the shear stress on the fault. So when you do that, actually, what is interesting is that you find that these two maps, the principal direction of stress derived from the focal mechanism on the principal direction of train of the strain rate tensor are, are parallel. 
and the shape also of the of the tensor are the same. So this is an indication that the the state of stress represented by the focal mechanism is very is simply uh, uh, proportional to uh, the, the 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 stress changes elastic stress changes resu resulting from um, from geodetic deformation. So because of that, to estimate Coulomb stress changes, all you need is is a scalar that's going to represent uh, the strain rate changes. So here is a map of the second invariant of the strain rate uh, tensor, and uh, it should be equivalent to, uh, to a, a map of Coulomb stress changes. So you have a high rate along uh, the, the, the front of, of, of the Himalaya, high rate of Coulomb stress increase, and you can see also a few, a few more faults uh, popping up. So the next thing you can do is uh, compare um, the size specificity with the strain uh, with the strain rate. You may remember that I said that if we neglect the nucleation time of earthquakes, we expect the size specificity rate to be proportional to the stressing rate. So this is something we can test that we can test in this context. So what um, we've done with Vicky, we've just bin the size specificity into uh, bins of, of constant strain rate. And for each population, we draw the gutenberg richter distribution, which is shown here. So the earthquake falling in area of high strain rate are plotted in, in red. They have a higher A value and uh, a certain B value. When you look at the other beans, uh, you see that they are gradually lower. So you can see that the A value gets lower and lower, the lower the strain rate is. So um, what you can do next is plot the value of, or the B value is not changing. All the, the slopes are about the same. There is no statistical difference. So what you can do next is plot the A value as a function of the strain rate. And here you have a, a nearly linear uh, relationship, which is what you would expect from uh, that simple reasoning that I introduced earlier based uh, on the spring slider system. So here you can simply use the geodetic strain rate to actually uh, estimate the variation of, of A uh, in space. The variation of B don't, don't seem to be significant, so we impose the B value of, of, of one. And then you can uh, estimate M max. I, I didn't explain the details of that, but based on this uh, strain budget uh, that I mentioned earlier. So uh, uh, an interesting finding when you do that is that you, you find that in all bins, you find the same, um, the same uh, maximum magnitude of 8.7 for the, for the whole area. Next, you can use this uh, model to do standard probability size because of the assessment maps, like what is shown here. So here you have the PGA to be, ex to be exceeded with 10% probability uh, over uh, 50 years. And this is what we get from uh, the approach I just described. And this is uh, the map that was produced by uh, the global earthquake model. And you can see that they are very similar. So this example shows that how you can go from geodesy the measurement of geodetic uh, uh, strain uh, to uh, to earthquake forecasting in in space, and this is time dependent. So let's now uh, move to discuss how we can do uh, what we can do when uh, the the loading is changing. Uh, so we are going to talk now about induced earthquakes. So. I, I will review a few examples. Uh, I'll start with the Groningen uh, example. So Groningen is the largest continental uh, gas field in, in Western Europe. Um, gas has been extracted for a reservoir about 300, uh, three kilometers depth. And the reservoir is about uh, 200 uh, meter thick on average. And this resulted uh, in subsidence of the ground, see, which is what is shown here. So Johnny Smith has been compiling all the leveling data uh, GPS data in some measurement to, to produce a model of the time evolution of subsidence. Here you have the cumulated subsidence since the onset of production uh, with a peak subsidence of about 40 uh, centimeters. So the reservoir has been compacting as a function of the drop of the pressure in the reservoir. 
So uh, starting in the 80s, uh, so production started, I didn't say, uh, in the in, uh, end of the 60s. And all that happened initially was subsidence. Starting in the 90s, uh, earthquakes started to be recorded. And, and the correlation with, with the uh, reservoir is not ambiguous. These are clearly induced by, um, by the gas extraction. So we have a, a long lag uh, between the onset of production and, uh, and the, the onset of uh, seismicity. So uh, of, of about uh, 20 years, that needs to be explained. And you see that initially the, the seismicity increased exponentially for relatively constant extraction. The blue curve is the accumulated extraction as a function of time, and the red curve is the accumulated number of earthquakes as a function of time. So uh, we, we developed a, a suite of, 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 of models. Um, the first one is a simplified reservoir model. Uh, so we go from uh, flow rates at the well to uh, pore pressure in the reservoir. Then we have a mechanical model to relate pore pressure to subsidence at the surface. And, and, and we use the, the geodetic measurements to actually uh, inform the mechanical model so that we can use that mechanical model to calculate uh, stress changes in the, in the medium. And then uh, given these stress changes, we calculate the seismicity rate uh, changes using that formulation that I introduced earlier uh, based on rate and state and um, with a threshold. So, uh, and then you can calculate with, with that, that, uh, th this framework, uh, the stress changes at any depth within the reservoir, outside the reservoir, or so on. So I don't go over the detail of that, but let me show you the prediction we get, uh, which is what is shown here. So this is time, and here this is uh, the, the earthquake rate, the average uh, each year. So the red curve is the observed uh, seismicity. So you see the initial uh, nearly exponential increase of the, of the seismicity. And then you have a drop because by 2014, um, the, the regulator imposed um, a drop in the production rate. The blue line is showing uh, the prediction from our best uh, fitting model. So you can see that the model fits extremely well uh, the, the evolution in time of the, of the size specificity rate. And it does fit also the distribution in space of the size specificity rate. Here, this is the observed distribution. And here you have the predicted uh, distribution. Um, the model also predicts relatively well uh, the, the, the expected maximum magnitude. The red is the observed maximum magnitude as a function of time. And in blue, uh, this is the expected value from based on the number of earthquakes predicted by the model and assuming a constant uh, B value. So, um, so it looks like this formalism that I introduced earlier is, is doing a, a good job at fitting the observations. An important element is the threshold. Uh, it's relatively small value, but it's very important to explain the lag uh, of the of the size specificity. The fact that the size specificity uh, started producing earthquake larger than um, about one one point five, uh, one point two uh, in in the eighties uh, is because of of this threshold. Um, the earthquake are. are, are are not uh, instantaneous, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into the detail of that. Uh, but this is a case where taking into account the fact that earthquake nucleation takes a finite time uh, actually helps fitting the observation. So now that you have a model, um, then you can uh, test the, the, the forecast. You take half the data, you inform the parameters of the model. So TA, A sigma, and uh, on the threshold, and then you make a forecast for uh, the other half of the catalog, and you can see that the forecast fits the observation relatively well. Uh, you can also do, do a prospective uh, forecast, uh, which is shown here. So this is a scenario here that was uh, proposed uh, with, with a tapering of production uh, for the coming uh, decade with the end of production uh, by about 2030. And so once you have the flow rates at all the wells, you can actually run the model forward and you can uh, predict uh, the time evolution of the seismicity rate. And from that, you can get the probability of having an earthquake larger than five 
uh, 5.55 or so, and as a function of time. Or uh, so you can you you can actually uh, derive all all the all the information you need to do um, um, a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment. Another thing that you can do in principle once you have a model like the what I've shown is that you can start to test uh, um, mitigation proce procedures. Um, and for example, here, this is a, a thought experiment where there's one well at the middle, where in that case, we assume that we have injection, and then we have four wells for control, uh, where uh, extraction uh, is, is, uh, is calculated uh, optimally so that to reduce the seismicity. So, um, so in, in this system, this is the predicted seismicity rate. You have seismicity at the beginning, and then the, the wells around are responding and are going to shut down uh, the seismicity. So it's just a thought experiment to show that this kind of models can be used for uh, control and optimization. Let's move to uh, uh, other examples. Um, yeah, I didn't say it, but for Groningen, the seismicity occurs near the top of the reservoir. Uh, probably just outside the reservoir, there's a debate about whether they are within the, the, the reservoir or, or outside. Um, but I mean, poor elastic stresses outside the reservoir might play a big role. Here is an example where actually it's very obvious that the seismicity is driven by poor elastic stress changes. This is a geothermal um, um, field, the Raft River uh, geothermal field in Idaho. And uh, the hot water is pumped from uh, a depth of about 1.5 kilometers uh, from an aquifer at the top of a crystalline basement and uh, is re-injected at those uh, other wells. So um, the re-injection re occurs at a shallower uh, aquifer that is about five me 500 meters uh, depth below the surface. Because uh, of this difference of depth between uh, the, the deep aquifer and the shallower one, uh, you have actually subsidence resulting for the pore pressure decrease at depth and uplift resulting from uh, the injection in the shallow well. And they don't balance each other because they occur at different depths. And you can see that very clearly in the in-star measurement. You have a zone of uplift in red uh, that, that coincides very well with the location of the wells. Uh, what is actually intriguing is that uh, the, the, the operation has resulted in seismicity in the basement. You have a pore pressure drop here. So if the, 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 the hydrothermal system is connected to this aquifer, you would expect uh, the fault to be stabilized because the pore pressure in the basement should be decreasing with time. So you would not expect induced seismicity just from the effect of pumping water out of the deep aquifer, but seismicity was triggered and it's, it's clearly correlated with, um, with uh, the, the, the zone of, of uh, uh, geothermal activity. So, um, so Bingley uh, has been doing some, some, uh, some modeling of, of, of the whole system taking into account the injection of the, of the cold water on the, on the extraction of the hot water. And you can fit quite well the geodetic measurements uh, with that. And then you can calculate the coolant stress changes in the basement. And so what is interesting is that you have coolant stress increase in the basement, essentially due to the poor elastic loading uh, introduced by the reinjection at shallower depth. So the seismicity falls in the area of coolant stress increase, which is mostly driven by, by the injection of the cold water at depth. We could not uh, uh, test the model in terms of the evolution of time because the, the, the operator did, doesn't provide information on, on the flow rate. So we could not go much further into uh, fitting, uh, analyzing those data. Let's look at another example where we have a lot of information from the operator. So we've been working closely with ST1. We've been doing uh, this time uh, um, uh, a stimulation, hydraulic stimulation for enhanced geothermal system uh, at um, on the campus, Otaniemi campus near Helsinki. So uh, the well goes to a depth of about six kilometers. And here I'm showing the seismicity that resulted from uh, five stages 
of, of stimulation. Uh, so they started with the deeper part and the yellow part is, is the latest uh, stimulation. And the color coding shows the earthquakes uh, that were, um, that were uh, detected or located using uh, seismometers at the surface, but also in a deep borehole at a depth of about three kilometers. So uh, it, it's a very nice seismicity catalog. And uh, that was put by, uh, together, this one, by, um, by Leonard uh, et al. Um, at ETH. So um, here you have the evolution. The black dots are showing the, the earthquake as a function of distance from the injection point on time. The red curve is just showing for reference what would be uh, the expectation if you were injecting that constant rate uh, due to pore pressure diffusion. So, uh, so we analyzed this catalog in, in detail. Uh, so this is work of Theo Kim. Here you have the seismicity rate detected as a function of time, the blue line. And the orange curve is showing uh, the injection rate. And the color shading in the background is showing the different stages of, of injection. So you see that it's a relatively complicated uh, injection history, which actually uh, was great for us uh, to uh, help constrain uh, constrain the model, uh, you have poses of different time of with different durations, and you have injection rate at, at different at different rates. So one characteristic of this data, which is well known actually from other uh, examples, is that at shutdown, where they stop actually pumping water in, the seismicity rate decay typically following the omorino. You see a decay that is close to one over t, so it follows just just like what is observed following aftershocks. Although in that case, it's clearly not an aftershock sequence. So this is one characteristic uh, of those data, and you see the, that the seismicity rate uh, tends to scale with the injection rate. So um, Theo has been doing an, uh, has been doing some honor analysis of of the the, the pressure data to derive. Uh, the hydraulic uh, diffusivity, and on 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 then he has uh, combined uh, following the approach of uh, developed by Paul Siegel and uh, and Lou in a paper from 2015 is co is combining uh, stress changes due to pore elasticity and uh, on the seismicity rate predicted by rate on state friction. Uh, to produce synthetic catalogs or to predict the, the seismicity rate as a function of space on time. So we are back to the equation that I was introducing earlier. In that case, the threshold doesn't matter at all because uh, the stress changes in, um, due to the injection are very high, much higher than, than the typical value we get when we try to feed the data at, um, at Greningen. Actually, I didn't talk about the, the threshold for... Um, uh, for the raft river, it's also a small value of the order of of um, of uh, maybe thirty or um, uh, kilopascal, something like that. So uh, here you see uh, the fit of the model to the observations. Uh, the dark blue curve is the seismicity rate as a function of time, and the purple uh, curve with the shading is the prediction uh, from the model. Um, here you have the prediction now in space. The red dots are the relocated uh, events. So it's a subset of the original catalog. The original catalog has something like 65,000 events. And, and here you have more like uh, a couple of thousands of events that could be relocated. So what you can see is that uh, the synthetic catalog represented by the, the, the green dots, the, the black dots are fitting relatively well uh, the observed seismicity. I didn't comment on these clusters. These clusters are due probably to a leak along the casing. So they plot at a large distance from the injection because they are actually uh, at, at shallower depth. But you see that the model fits pretty well uh, the data in time and in space. So, um, yeah, in, the, in this model, the the the, the Omori law actually is driven essentially by pore pressure diffusion, but I, I, I can go back uh, to that point uh, during the discussion if you wish. 
Uh, so now that you have this model, you can do some, 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 you can test forecasting and what Theo has, has been uh, doing, actually following the suggestion of David Dempsey, uh, is uh, take uh, only a fraction of the data, the first stage, to inform the model, to get the model parameters, and use those model parameters to do a forecast for the rest of the stimulation. And actually, uh, you get an amazingly good fit uh, when, you, when you do that. Uh, the, the, the fit is not as good, of course, as when you invert the parameter from the whole data set, but it's, 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 it's quite close. Um, so an important uh, implication of that work is that uh, you cannot directly infer the hydraulic deficiency from the migration of the size specificity as a function of time, because the distribution of size specificity depends on not only on the proportional diffusion, but also on, on the fact that nucleation take times. And so the size specificity is lagging behind the proper front because of this, uh, the duration of nucleation. So this is shown by this example where the divisibility is the same in the two plots. And the black dots are showing a synthetic catalog calculated for two different values of A. So this one has a larger value of A. So it takes longer for the earthquake to, uh, to nucleate. And so the seismicity front lags much further away be, behind the, the pore pressure uh, front di diffusion. So um, yeah, just a message that it's not that straightforward to infer uh, divisivity, either divisivity from the pattern of seismicity. Okay, so last, uh, last slide, po po possibly of, do of doing control. So in this context also, you could imagine using that model to do uh, control and optimization. Uh, uh, Teho is, is working on that. I'm not going to show any slide at this point. But I wanted to mention another uh, mechanism that I, 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 I alluded to uh, earlier on, but didn't demonstrate, is that I said that the nucleation uh, size, so the minimum size of, of, of slip uh, on a fault so that the, 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 the slipping zone can evolve into a seismic rupture has to be larger than a, a critical value uh, for earthquake to be possible. And on this critical value scale as one over sigma minus p. And uh, so with high pop pressure, you could uh, kill actually the seismicity or, uh, or low normal stress. I'm showing work that uh, KJM has been doing, which demonstrate uh, for real this effect. So we're looking at the aftershocks of the Ridgecrest earthquakes, uh, the blue uh, the blue dot. And this is interesting because this earthquake occurred in the vicinity of a geothermal plant, the COSO geothermal plant. And what you see immediately from the pattern of aftershocks is that the geothermal plant area is devoid of, of, of aftershocks. And um, it is all the more surprising that when you look at the seismicity before uh, the, the, the Ridgecrest earthquake, represented by the, the gray dots, so this is the catalog over 30 years before the Ridgecrest earthquakes, you see that there were plenty of seismicity in that area. So it's not that the area is not capable of producing earthquake, but it didn't during the, 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 the Ridgecrest earthquake. And here, the, this is the coolant stress changes due to uh, the rich crest uh, earthquake. You see that COSO is in the area of increased coolant stress. So you would you should have had uh, aftershocks. So um, KJ has been doing some modeling of, of the impact of the development of the geothermal feed on, on the stress. And without going in, in, in much detail, what happens is that the, 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 the production of geothermal heat from the, the, from the area has produced some geothermal contra some contraction, some thermal contraction that is uh, very visible in the, uh, in the INSAR data. So this is INSAR measurements of a ground displacement produced uh, initially by uh, Yuri Fialko and Mark Simons. And you see subsidence over the geothermal field, and uh, we know from um, from the, the the operational data that this subsidence is not due to a drop of pore pressure; it is due to thermal contraction. Thermal contraction is resulting in a drop of normal stress. So actually, you are, you are producing a seismic deformation because of that. So uh, the initial state of stress. Uh, looking here only at the greatest, uh, at the largest Mohr circle, where is represented by the blue line, but 
as production is 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 um, is occurring, uh, you have you're, you're pushing the medium toward failure because of thermal contraction, and um, and then the, the the more circular shrinking, shrinking, and in the end you have very little shear stress left to drive further size PCT. So I think this is um, an elegant demonstration of uh, of the effect of um, change of effective normal stress on a seismic deformation on how you can deplete actually the system of elastic strain to drive further earthquakes. So, um, so maybe uh, a way to, to go would be to develop more geothermal uh, production along the San Andreas fault. That is a bit provocative, but that could be uh, an interesting discussion to have. So I think it's a high time to conclude. Uh, so I hope that I have convinced you that um, we can forecast seismicity based on, on simple principles um, like the coolant stress uh, changes and on the earthquake nucleation being, um, being um, governed by return state friction. Uh, that this uh, framework applies to natural earthquake and induced seismicity. For natural earthquake, time dependency is, is actually very difficult to test. Uh, it's possible in certain cases, like we've pond um, uh, has been doing some work on that. But for induced seismicity, it's much easier because we have all the parameters we need to calculate time changes uh, um, of stress. Uh, we need to take the initial uh, strength excess, the distance from uh, failure uh, in, in areas where the perturbation uh, occurs uh, in, a, in, a, in a quiet uh, tectonic environment, as is the case in, in, in Groningen, but also the case, let's say, in Oklahoma, the Permian Basin, and, and so on. And um, finally, earthquake nucleation cannot be considered instantaneous. Um, uh, it's, it's important to fit the observation uh, from a Taniemi, and also, also I didn't show it uh, for, for Groningen as well. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the kind of, of uh, physics-based model I've shown today might be used actually to, um, in principle, could be used uh, for controlled optimization of, of reservoir operation. So I think it's time to conclude, so I, I'd be happy to take your questions. Great. Well, really interesting talk, Jean-Philippe, and uh, You're welcome. appreciate the, uh, the overview. There's... There are a number of uh, interesting questions as well in the chat. Um, so I can maybe kind of read them out. I'm gonna summarize a bit. And then uh, um, if you're willing, maybe we could have more of an informal kind of conversation, maybe go into depth, a bit more depth on some of these afterwards, if uh, if you're able to spare the time, Jean-Philippe. Sure, of course, my pleasure. Um, so the first one, Colin Serres is asking, uh, um, just how many parameters are in the model specifically for, for Groningen. So you talked about a flow simulation and a, gym, a mechanical, geomechanical model, and then the seismic model. Um, okay, so this is a good question. So the reservoir model, uh, we use the geometry that was provided by Shell. So we didn't play with the reservoir geometry. This is a given from the operator. We inverted uh the, the the parameters of of the reservoir model so we have uh the the permeability on the, on the gas saturation uh so it's i think it's it's two parameters and we assume that they are homogeneous for the whole reservoir uh so it's it's a very simple reservoir model and it fits the observation relatively well uh within 0 0.5 megapascal the pressure measurements then you have on top of that uh, the, the the geomechanical mod uh, model. Uh, actually, we impose um, uh, we impose the 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 the, the elastic moduli and uh, on the Poisson ratio. So we didn't play with them. So uh, that 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 was um, that was uh, we we took standard value, and and then we have the three parameters due to uh to, to the the nucleation model so the the threshold on the two parameters from Dietrich uh model so it's we're talking about five six parameters uh that we are inverting so it, it's actually not a lot yeah yeah could i uh pop in there um colin says here uh, thanks for a very interesting talk um so did any of the parameters uh were any of them surprising or were they in the the ballpark that you expected 
Uh, no, the the in terms of the the for example the reservoir models, we 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 get uh, values very close to the to the mean of the Moraes model, the model uh, that uh, Shell has developed for that reservoir. For the rate on state model, it's it's more difficult to say um, because we don't have a lot of of example in nature where those parameters can be demonstrated can be evaluated. So you can compare the A value with the laboratory measurements, and the A value that we get uh, from the, the the field seems to be lower than the one measured in in the laboratory. Yeah, but uh, uh, it depends on 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 what is the 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 normal stress at which you you I mean the what well, because you what you solve for is a sigma so you need to make an assumption about sigma to get a so and the yeah. and the b the b value was about one the b value is about one yeah in in everything I've shown actually the b value is always one we didn't play okay. with with that yeah all right thank you yeah You're right. welcome. what what's uh, I think there's another really good general question here maybe we can address and then there's some others that maybe we can continue after kind of the formal part of the, the webinar here but uh, Rick Gibson's I'll, I'll generalize kind of Rick's question I guess uh, you know you've got your training period and then your forecast period that you've shown a few times and uh, um, have you looked at kind of uncertainty do you look at a, a stochastic inversion to look at a range of, of models and um, it seemed like some of the later examples there was maybe a range of four yeah. parts. So I, I didn't show uh, a lot of that. Actually, there's a student in the group, Ojat Kave, who, who might be on the call, who is, who is actually doing exactly that. But uh, this is not something we have we we have yet developed much. Uh, everything we've done was to develop actually the framework to invert the model parameters with uncertainties. So we have the uncertainties on the model parameter, on, and we can take those uncertainties into account to do the forecast. But we haven't done yet systematic tests of of the forecasting performance this is a work in progress but we, but we have all the tools to do that we know how to propagate uncertainties in the forecast great well maybe i'll try to squeeze in one more quick question here before we wrap up the formal part so han cow's asking uh, a question just on the scale of the modeling so um, going from kind of the regional scale down to maybe individual injection wells could you comment on the, the scaling aspects and um... yeah so what what I wanted to show today is that actually the formalism that we use at the very large scale is is very much the same as the one that is used at the very local scale so the the, the mechanic is the same uh, at the very large scale I didn't mention you know like the, the the nucleation process because I was looking at reality time long time evolution so you cannot constrain the parameters the same way but but the the, the physics is re, is really the same and works quite well yeah great well again there's some more questions maybe we can uh, we can continue the conversation here in a few minutes but uh, we've reached the end of the hour so on behalf of Arma and the, the committee Jean Philippe we'd like to end end the the participants, we'd like to uh, thank you for a really interesting overview. It's uh, um, a great piece of work and nice to see that we can come up with some simple physics models that uh, that match observations um, exactly in line with kind of the, the ARMA philosophy, I guess. Um, so I guess on behalf of ARMA, I'll, I'll wish everybody a, uh, a happy holiday and uh, look forward to seeing uh, many of you early January, January January 13th, we have Denise Templeton. Again, just as a reminder, the invitation will come out. But uh, again, it'll be a, an interesting webinar looking at uh, um, practices for uh, CCS um, mitigation of se seismicity with CCS. So um, very topical as well. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a very good holiday. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So. So Jean Philippe, if you if you have a few more minutes, we, yeah, we yeah, can uh, continue the conversation. Just, yeah, yeah. And um, the uh, so Jens has got a a good question as well. It's uh, it's a little long, so Jens, why don't you go ahead and and uh, ask your question? Yeah, being concise is hard, especially when I'm trying to pay attention to what you're saying at the moment I'm writing. Um, but I was the the fundamental question is basically what happens if um, the strain rate is not correlated to the um, the actual in situ state of stress 
um, like in the Himalaya example you gave, they were very nicely correlated, and that was helpful because then you could um, you could assume that whatever stress is being added was stressing critically stressed faults further. But mm -hmm. in a case like the Central and Eastern U.S. Uh, and and uh, well, Central and Eastern North America, I guess, uh, where glacial isostatic adjustment is uh, kind of the primary driver of the drain rate, in some cases, they that is basically relaxing the in situ stresses, like the you know the, the compressive state of stress in, in much of the eastern part of the continent. Um, but there's a lot of there you know dominantly uplift in some areas that is that is relaxing that compressive state of stress. So actually, the critically stressed faults are probably becoming less critically stressed there, um, at least in some cases. And so, so I'm wondering what you how you would have to deal with that situation since that's you know a lot of the induced seismicity that we see in North America is in those those places. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, uh, uh, Jens, Eric. That that's a very good question. Uh, so I took the Himalayan case because it's a little simpler because it's very active. Uh, when you go to a place that is quieter, uh, like the 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 Midwest, then you have exactly that problem that uh, the geodetic strain it taken alone is not representing the Coulomb stress changes because you have rotation of the stress tensor with time due to post to uh, post glacial rebound, and so you, you you would need to do the full you know stress calculation to get Coulomb stress uh, changes, and and um, it's it's more difficult uh, to do. You you cannot uh, directly transfer what I I, I described. You, you will need a, a full model of post glacial rebound, take into account the initial stress. So everything gets a bit more complicated. Yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But that answers that. So that's kind of the way the way forward would be. You account for for the post glacial rebound and the the background stress. Yeah, and that's right. Could, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Indeed. Yeah. And in that case, it's it's. I mean, rotation of the of the stress tensor with time is going to probably be important important factor, which is negligible in the Himalayan case. Yeah. Great. And then Andy Barber had a question about the, the temperature change. I, I don't see, I think Andy might have left. Yeah, no, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, it's an interesting result at COSO. I was just struck by the, the modeling results suggesting, I don't know, I, I forget the scale, but something like 50 to 100 C of production temperature change. I mean, is that sustainable? Like, do the operators confirm such a big thing? I mean, so we, it, it's it's true that it's relatively large. We contacted the operator to to ask for comment about uh, our findings, and 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 we didn't get any response. So I I we, we, yeah. we don't we don't know. But uh, we've seen uh, uh, publications uh, suggesting that there's a drop of temperature. Yeah. So uh, I guess but, I'm also curious how then the the thermal if if that's true. Um, there, there were you mentioned the thermoelastic process that would that's contracting the ground. Wouldn't that also induce seismicity? And so I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah. Know. So that that that's that's result into um, um, uh, the, the state of stress getting closer to failure because because of that. But at the same time, uh, it contributes to increase of the nucleation. Uh, size. So actually most of the deformation that occurs because of that turns out to be a seismic. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Which, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Thanks. It's a great talk. Yeah. Thank you. So Jean-Philippe, I, I had one. Uh, it's tied into your threshold parameter. And uh, as you nicely explained, I guess it's a control on the, the onset, the delay for the onset of the seismicity. Um, I'm curious, on the uh, the aftershock sequence, either the Amori decay or if you're running uh, mitigation scenarios where you're shutting things down, do you see the same phenomena? Do you sort of reduce down to that uh, threshold and does the seismicity kind of turn off at that point or what's the... So the, the threshold uh, represents the initial strength excess. So it's okay. how far you are from rupture initially. So where you are at the point that you have a large earthquake, you've 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 pushed the the, the population of fault to criticality already. So the threshold doesn't matter anymore. Okay. Yeah. Once it's at failure, basically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Great. Well, I actually had another one, if I if I could, maybe on the oh, initial Himalayan example, your different strain rates, um, you talked about, you know, the variation in A value with, with strain rate. Um, and then you made a, a comment that then the, uh, the, uh, the MX for each of the, the, the bins was identical, but I guess a probability would would scale with with the a value so even though the m max was the same the probability for for m max that's right yeah 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 so so the probability of getting a larger rate is way 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 smaller for area of all strain of small strain because the a value is much lower so you're right yeah yeah so but but the bound on the maximum possible event turns out to be the same value and that's simply because the the b value is one and on the, the 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 linear relationship between stress rate and size specificity rate, an implication of that actually is that the M max turns out to be constant. But but you're right in a low uh, in an area of low strain, you get a very low probability of earthquake because of A. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We do have one hand up. Uh, um, yeah. Sean, you may have seen it by Zijun Fang. Oh yeah, Zijun. Yeah, go ahead, see John. Oh, hi. Oh, so Hello. I'm speaking a call today. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, so John, uh, good to nice see you, see you again. Uh, so, I have actually two questions. So, I mean, we have success in using the, ty the type of uh, um, model we described in applying to places with large volume injections like a uh, Gorgon CO2 project or MCPU, uh, this uh, mid Texas uh, with water injections. But the, the problem I'm always facing, so we have unconventional operations. And uh, what they get is that sometimes they got us all these small earthquakes, negative one, negative two, and suddenly there's two or three. And then they ask me, oh, your model can, can do that? Uh, yeah. Since there's no way for 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 forecasting something, some outlier things, uh, I yeah. just want to hear your opinion. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we 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 looked a, li a little bit at, at that with a, a jet and on on Matteo was uh, was on the call. Uh, so you can evaluate the 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 probability that the earthquake are outside the bound that you expect from the Poisson process. So you combine the fact that you have a Poisson process with, uh, uh, with the gutenberg richter distribution. And you can see if, uh, what, if you have an increase of size BCD, larger magnitude event, whether they are really significant or whether they can be considered as, as part of the population that is expected from, from the Poisson process. So you, you could sort of quantify uh, you know the mm -hmm. significance. You know, is it really an outlier, or is it something that 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 is within the expected range uh, of values? That, that's something we we can do, and actually, your JAT is is developing tools to to do that. Okay, okay, great yeah. skill then. Yeah, and uh, so in one of your slides, you showed a uh, uh, like a design of a mitigation in chronic, and basically you're extracting uh, or inject modulating the pressure. So what, what, what kind of tool do you use? It's being developed by GNT? So the, the, the optimization technique was developed by a, a collaborator uh, from mm -hmm. France, Ioannis okay. Stefano, uh, and, and uh, we worked with him to, uh, to, uh, to adapt his, his, uh, his technique. So he's starting from the, from the, the, the differential equations de de describing the system and, and uh, on the, you go straight from the differential equations to an optimization to a control scheme. Yeah, I would not be able okay. to describe that. I don't know if Teho is on the call. Maybe he could say a few more words about how this really works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know we have we have greater rest time simulation models. The problem is just like they are too slow. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, everything we do is is actually meant to provide very fast calculation time. That's important. So that if you do optimization numerically, it's possible. But actually, if you can do it numerically, it's even. Uh, I mean, uh, analytically, that's even better. And this is what Johannes is doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great, and anybody else have any, any questions they'd like to ask? So go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, Jean-Philippe, it seems the crowd has gone asosmic, so the... <laughs> I have a okay. question about... Oh, aftershocks. <laughs> Go ahead, Marty. I, I have a question about uh, the condition that uh, uh, the pre if pressure is uh, very close to the normal stress, uh, to the fault, we won't have in, in, uh, instability of the fault sleep. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I expect the other way around. If pressure is higher, we, we get more toward instability of the fault. Yeah. So, um, yeah, actually, I, I could show a slide about that if, 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 uh, if you sure. want, because that, 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 uh, that would help understand how this works, because it's... It's a question I have once in a while. Yeah. Let me share. I can go full screen. So let's look at the, the spring on slider system here. Um, as, the, as the slider is moving, the force driving the slider is going to decrease linearly, right? This is just due to the stif stiffness of the spring. So this is the drop in the driving stress. So the blue curve is showing how friction uh, is, is, is evolving uh, during sliding. So the condition to have, uh, to have uh, um, a stick slip event is that the friction must drop faster than the driving stress. Then you have an excess of, of driving stress that can generate acceleration and you get a stick slip behavior. So the condition for failure is that that slope here needs to be less than the slope of the blue curve. So now, uh, if, you, if you look at those, uh, uh, if you go from static to dynamic over a certain distance, uh, you, what you find is that if sigma n my p uh, minus p, so it's the effective normal stress, is 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 very small. Then that that uh, that curve will will always be uh, uh, shallower than the driving stress, and so you you only get a seismic slip. So this is the same condition, right? right written now for uh, rate on state friction. So the green line is showing a, a linear approximation of of the drop of friction during sliding. And I'm just writing here the condition that this, this line is steeper that to get, uh, let's say, uh, a stick slip event is steeper than the red line. This is what you get. This is the condition. You get mu s static friction minus dynamic friction has to be larger than this. So you see that if this goes to, uh, to zero, then this, this is never satisfied and you can only, only get creep. So when this quantity sigma n minus p is very small, you get activation of the fault. The fault is going to be activated uh, because of, of the unclamping, but the slip will be a seismic. And uh, some years ago, uh, I was involved in, in, in the analysis of an experiment with Yves Guglielmi. In, uh, we did an injection with Frederick Kappa of a fault in France. And they could demonstrate that this analysis works very well. I mean, hypo pressure promoted a seismic creep on, on the fault. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. It's kind of has an interesting consequence, I guess, if hydraulic fracture and simulation, right, where your uh, extremely high net pressure may, uh, depending on how much that net pressure uh, an activated fault sees, maybe it goes from uh, seismically active to uh, to a creep state. That's right. So yeah, there's, there's always this belief that when you inject, you're going to trigger seismicity. It's true, but actually you, you also release a strain by a seismic uh, by a seismic deformation. And this part is, is, is not easy to observe, right? 
because seismic, I mean, seismometers doesn't see it. It's only when you have a geodetic signal that you can really demonstrate that it's there. Yeah. Right, right. Interesting. All right. Well, if anybody has any other questions, if not, uh, we can we can maybe wrap this up. So again, thank you very much. Yeah, the, yeah. The thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Our pleasure. And, so uh, there's a lot lot of interest, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Great talk. Great talk. We had 60 people, 62 people in the talk uh, at some point. Very good. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you so much for presenting. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah. I really have appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Thank you. And a happy holiday. Thank yeah. You. Goodbye, Yancy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, Zidion. Bye. Bye. Bye.